science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. Exciting news! Texts from Bunsen, the ebook that Chris and I worked all summer on, is out to the public. You can pick it up at our website, www.bunsenburnerbmd.com. I know it's a little plug at the start, but we're just really proud of what we put together. And it's completely separate of all the science stuff that we do because text from Bunsen is lighthearted and silly. It's the personified dogs texting us in the family plus other pets. So everybody has a different kind of characterization in the ebook. And with some special help from our cartoonist, the book turned out really good. So check that out if, if you are looking for some humor and a love letter to dogs. School's back in the swing of things. Chris and I are both very busy. Chris's new position at the high school is keeping her very, very busy. Um, Adam's back with band, and I figured out how to live stream the dogs from the new community we're launching. And my students find that to be the best part of their day, is saying hi to Bunsen and Beaker um, before we get started with some science. All right. Well, speaking of science, in science news, we're going to talk about how artificial intelligence is reading brain waves to read what the heck you just heard. Yeah, that is bananas. In pet science, we were asked to take a look at how foxes in a certain area of the world are being domesticated and how it's fast forwarding their domestication like what happened to dogs over thousands of years. In Ask an Expert, we have the hilarious Lauren Farr, who's going to talk to us about a type of woodpecker. Yes, she is a woodpecker expert. Hey, dogs, what do you call a woodpecker without a beak? A headbanger. That joke is for some heavy metal lovers out there. Okay, on with the show, because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, we are going to break down a study about artificial intelligence. Now, we've talked to Dr. Janelle Shane on the podcast uh, about two years ago. She's an artificial intelligence scientist, and she put to rest my worries that the robot apocalypse will rise up and replace humans um, because she said that artificial intelligence isn't any more, you know, doesn't have any more computing power than a worm. But there have been some breakthroughs, I think, since we've chatted with her. I don't think we need to worry about Skynet just yet, but there's some really interesting applications of artificial intelligence that have been in the news in the last year. All right, so let's take a look at this one that reads your brain. Now, where do you think this artificial intelligence program was developed? I'll give you three hints. Hint number one, it was developed by a giant company. Hit number two, they have a invested interest in getting artificial intelligence to read what you do. <laughs> and hit number three, um, the owner may be a robot. If you guessed Facebook, you're correct. Now, this comes from a report in August at ARXIV.org. First thing with artificial intelligence, and again, I'm not an AI scientist, but you have to train AI on data. So that's what they did. They trained this artificial intelligence to detect a whole bunch of words and sentences and hours and hours and hours and hours of speech in a whole bunch of different languages. The AI learned to recognize speech from words and the AI was okay at a, at a more complicated level, such as like a sentence. Paired with this data, the AI was also trained with brainwave activity from 169 volunteers. Now, I don't know if I should say it was trained, but it applied. The team took what it, the AI learned from these hours and hours of speech recordings and paired it with databases of brainwaves from these volunteers and the volunteers in the, the with the brainwaves they uh they listened to a whole bunch of different stories and um and sentences from stories I, I think one of them was like alice's adventures in wonderland then their brains were scanned using then their brains were scanned using a type of magnet encephalography and electroencephalography 
I hope I said that right. That is a long word. Triple word, word score in Scrabble. <laughs> AI was trained to learn speech. It was given a database of scanned brain waves, listening to uh, like different sentences and, and stories, right? The AI then had to make predictions about what the brain wave was hearing, the person, the brain person's brain wave was hearing, but they were given a thousand things to choose from. Using magnetoencephalography or MEG, the AI was correct up to 73% of the time. Using um, the electro one, uh, not so good. The researchers were happy that the AI was able to get a pretty good score in pairing what the brainwave was with what the person was listening to. But the problem was, is they had to give the AI stuff to choose from a thousand choices. So it's not like, it's not like they could hook in a, this AI system up to a machine that was reading the brainwaves of say somebody who was comatose, but you were talking to them and then the machine would be able to tell you what the person was hearing. That way you could say, oh, there's like brain activity there. It's decoding or something like that. It needs like this database of guesses. So it can't do it on, on its own. It's a first step though. If the AI has a, a uh, you know, if the AI has a list, it does okay. So the AI scientists in charge of the study were really happy, but they also cautioned that they're a long ways away from a computer being able to decode what you just heard. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, there was um, an article about these foxes that are being domesticated and a couple people tagged us and I was like, oh, okay, I've heard about this, but I never, and other, actually other scientists have talked to us about the domestication of these foxes um, and I haven't really done a deep, deep dive into it. I found a article that's talking about this and there's actually a book called How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog by Lee Allen Dugtkin and Ludmilla Trutt um, from the University of Chicago. And I don't want to give away the book. Um, I don't have the book, but I did find an article that was talking about what happened with these foxes. So the story starts with one of the authors, Ludmilla Trutt. Um, she took a train to Siberia in, in 1959 and visited these fox farms. Before we get to the foxes, remember one of the, the main idea about where dogs come from is our ancestors picked wolves and over the course of time selected the, the least bitey and scary wolves. And that artificial selection became how where dogs came from in a relatively short period of time, especially if you think about all the different dog breeds that there are compared to, you know, the full, the, the, the few wolf breeds that were around back then. Now the Siberia foxes is they they called, now the Siberian the Siberia foxes as they're called were a genetics experiment. These fox researchers um looked at the temperament of all of these different foxes every generation and remember uh wild foxes are kind of bitey <laughs> and the the calmest and uh the most gentle and the most friendly of all the foxes those ones were bred and the other ones were not. And within a few generations so we're talking like a shrill, a relatively short period of time, um, the foxes started to become more accepting of their handlers than the original population. This led the researchers on. So they're like, hey, we're on to something. In the short period of time, by taking the, only the nicest foxes and letting them have bye-byes, these new foxes are less bitey and scary. This involves Trot in 1960. Uh, she bought super calm foxes from the this project, and she continued the breeding pro project by taking only 10% of the calmest and nicest foxes and continuing to breed them. As a good scientist does, she also kept the aggressive foxes and uh, and and bred them as well. Now, a couple things started to happen with the nice foxes, the the tamer foxes. If you look at dogs compared to wolves, um, a lot of dogs have floppy ears. Some scientists think that floppy ears is a byproduct of tameness. The floppy ears kind of like hopped along with the genetics of the dogs through generations of artificial selection. And the same thing happened with foxes. 
Some of the foxes started to wag their tail. Some of the foxes were born with droopy ears. This experiment kept going for 60 years. Trut's now in her 80s. So what what are some of the other things that popped out from picking tameness? Uh, curly tails. Think of a fox with a curly tail. And baby face features like dogs. So by picking tameness, and maybe you have some bias there as the experimenter, the fox that looked like a baby, kind of like how puppies have those infantile features, those features started to become more and more prominent in each generation generation of fox. So what do the foxes do now? Are they like dogs? Well, they're dog-like. The the tamest of these foxes over the 60-year project love belly rubs. They'll flop on their back like a dog, but they don't necessarily do great following commands and obeying the humans. Um, they learn tricks, but it's not the same as a dog. Having access to a breeding program that was supercharged into picking the tamest foxes, this scientist over a relatively short period of time did the same thing that maybe our our ancestors who were just coming out of the ice age took thousands of years to do because like she already had the benefit of, of people capturing foxes with new technology and starting the breeding process. I think for our early ancestors, getting the nice wolf probably was a little bit tougher than capturing some foxes to start breeding them. Is this unethical? Well, I don't know. Is breeding animals for captivity unethical? That was brought up in the study that they're taking this wild animal and they're changing it through this breeding program. If you look at cows or chickens, they're very different than what they would have been had humans not had a hand in selecting the traits that we wanted and letting the other ones go. At the end of the day, it's an interesting experiment with a very small subsection of foxes. Using the knowledge of science that has been hard won over the last thousands and thousands of years, we can supercharge the artificial selection process. That's pet science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I'd let you know how you could help out the Science Podcast. The Science Podcast will always be free to download. You'll never have to worry about paying for it. But here are some ways that you can help us out. Number one, check out the merch store, www.bunsenburnerbmd.com. The merch store has adorable gear, the beaker stuffy, and now text from Bunsen. Number two, think about joining the Pawpack community. It's going to be replacing Patreon, so thank you Patreon supporters. But if you aren't part of the Pawpack, we'd love for you to join. Our new community will take what we do on Patreon and supercharge it. There's going to be so many cool perks to joining the Pawpack community. Look for it in the next couple weeks. Third, think about reviewing the Science Podcast on a podcast player and giving us a great score. It really helps. Back to the interview. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast, and I have Lauren Farr, avian ecologist, PhD student with me today. Lauren, how are you doing today? I am doing wonderful. Thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> we were talking before the recording about how I found you. And I have to ask you right off the, 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 the start. You have this adorable profile picture of yourself with a bird on your shoulder. Um, and I think it's the bird that we're going to be talking about later. But how did that profile picture come about? Where did you get that from? It's so good. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there, so there is this guy on Twitter named Ethan Black Mud Puppy is his uh, Twitter handle, and he will create these really cute, adorable little images, you know, for scientists or it, at, honestly anyone who, <laughs> who would like one, and and he'll give you the options to you know feature you know different animals or you know bugs, any, anything like that, and you can use them you know as profile pictures. So it's sort of this big thing on Twitter. You'll 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 see Ethan's work. Oh. Oh, oh, like Dr. Denny Rabiotti has it for yes, oh, okay. yes, okay. yes, 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 with all the different animals. Yeah, I and mean, you know, depending on what you study. So for me, I study birds, so I have a bird on my shoulder. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's people who study, you know, sharks, like David Schiffman. He's a big yep. shark guy, so he has, you know, a shark, you know, <laughs> sharks in his in his in his profile pic. And so Ethan's a wonderful, wonderful artist. So if you if you look on Twitter, you will be sure to find 
find his work. His his work is definitely popular, you know, among uh, scientists on science Twitter. <laughs> I got it. Okay, I've just made the connection. Uh, yes. Thanks, Lauren. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, where where are you in the world? Where are you calling into the podcast from? Yes. So I am calling in from Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> oh, okay. So, Raleigh, All right. North Carolina. Yes, yes. 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 So I am. I am a North Carolina girl. So I am um, born. I was born and raised in North Carolina. So I'm from a little town called Waxhaw, North Carolina. It's right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. So I always throw that bit in there because I start with Waxhaw, and some people know it, and some people are like, "Where in the world is that?" So when I throw in Charlotte, they'll make the connection. <laughs> Is there a wax? Is there a wax off North Carolina? You know, that would be that would be awesome. That that would totally be awesome. If you were into like the Karate question. Kid or something. Now I'm curious. <laughs> so Lauren, I, <laughs> Lauren, I introduced you as a as an ecologist yes. and a PhD student. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your your science training? Yes, of course, of course. So I will, uh, honestly, I'll take it all the way back to my undergrad. Let's do it. Um, so really, uh, I myself, I may go off on a tangent here, so forgive me, but I love <laughs> telling the story about, you know, my history of how I got involved with birds. So I myself, I was not originally interested in, you know, wildlife biology at all. Um, I, I, I grew up, you know, in a small rural town, you know, Waxhaw is a very small town, very, you know, rural environment. So I've been around wildlife all my life. Um, my, my, my dad, you know, my, my dad hunts, so he's a hunter. So he'd take me, you know, outside, you know, with them and, you know, go hunting in the woods. So I'm very familiar with that. My uncle was your, you know, regular backyard birder. He loved to watch the birds in his backyard. So I say these two things because I connect these two things in my story as, you know, being things that I was exposed to. But if you had asked me back then, if I were to be, you know, if I thought that I was going to be involved with any of these two things now, I would have thought you were crazy. So it was, <laughs> it was sort of like me. So, somebody to taps you in the shoulder, like Lauren, I'm from the future. You're going to yes, be, yes, exactly. be like, ah. exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so I really, in my academic journey, I have, I came full circle to where I connect those two things. And I'm like, wow, I, my interest was here. My interest and passion for these two things were here all along, but I went full circle to find them. So I originally grew up wanting to be a veterinarian because I absolutely love animals. I, I adore animals with all my heart. And so really, that was really the only thing, you know, for me, at least, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people, because I talk to a lot of people who have this similar story of wanting to be a veterinarian that, you know, it's mm -hmm. one of the, you know, only you know, or a few careers that we see, you know, that's, that's sort of like, okay, well, if you want to work with animals, then a veterinarian is the path for you. There's, there's yep. no other, there's no other, you know, there's no other way, you know, that's, that's possible. So I ran with wanting to be a veterinarian up until undergrad. I did an internship at my veterinarian's office um, in high school, right before uh, I went to undergrad. And that was sort of where it clicked that, you know, again, our veterinarians are wonderful and they do amazing jobs, but it sort of clicked with me that I couldn't really see myself doing this for the rest of my life. So I was sort of in a hard place because I was about to go to, you know, undergrad, but oh. I was still like, well, I don't know what I want to do now. Cause I mean, I still love animals, but you know, the veterinarian thing, I, I just, it just didn't click for me. I just, you know, didn't find what I was looking for there. So I'm stuck. So I attended uh, Wingate University, so it's a it's a little it's a small liberal arts college, um, mm -hmm. and so I went there actually for pharmacy school. So um, very very off of what you know I'm doing now, so very very different. But I went there for pharmacy school, believe it or not. So I was a biology major, but my first two semesters there were really really tough for me. The classes that I was taking, you know, I wasn't doing great academically, and I was just miserable. So I sort of, you know, had this talk with myself that, you know, okay, Lauren, that something, something needs to happen, something needs to change. So my professors at Wingate, they, they were really my rocks in, you know, getting me to sort of where I am today. So I have this one professor at Wingate University, um, and he studied birds. And he was mm -hmm. one of the ones who taught all of the um, you know, all of the, the wildlife courses, you know, so we taught like, you know, wildlife management, animal ecology, uh, you know, things, things of that nature. So all of the environmental courses is what he taught. So mm -hmm. I took this wildlife management course and that was what stuck with me that I oh. was you know, sort of like, Hmm, I want to know more about this field of wildlife biology, you know? So 
I had that. And then of course, again, he studied birds. So I went to him and I just latched onto him and I was like, look, I want to, <laughs> I want to start, I want to work with you. What, what, what do you do? So I started working with um, the species of bird called the Chinese blue breasted quail. So it's the world's smallest quail. Actually, they're really, really super, super cute. And I was looking at their vocal harmonics and how their vocal harmonics changed over time. So I did this research from the end of my sophomore year until I graduated and I absolutely loved it. So I graduated with an environmental biology degree. So I ended up switching my degree from biology to environmental biology and okay. It was to the point then after that where, well, I was sort of like, you know, okay, well, I, I want to continue with this. I want to learn more. I want to further my education and my expertise. So I ended up going to North Carolina State University, which is right here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, I wanted, I decided to pursue my degree, my master's degree in fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology, because um, NC State has, you know, one of the uh, best wildlife programs out there. So I knew I was in good hands. <laughs> So um, for my master's degree, you know, I, I still I, I worked with birds and, you know, studied birds and um, on the topic of urbanization. So specifically urban noise and light pollution and, and its effects that it had on birds. So that was my master's work. And then now I'm doing a Ph.D. on a totally different topic with a totally different species. But still, I'm still in you know the wildlife field, still studying birds. So I say all this again. Looking at it, I came full circle to going back to sort of giving my dad and my uncle that credit for sort of exposing <laughs> me to these two things. But again, me not knowing back then that this was where I would end up. This is Discovery Matters, a collection of stories and insights on matters of discovery that advance life sciences. Brought to you by the people at Cytiva and driven by our curiosity for all things science. And we've actually heard that it's got real health benefits. One listener told us that she started running faster thanks to listening to us. So do it for your health or for your curiosity. Either way, give us a listen and a rating. Do they, Lauren, do they tease you that they, that we are the ones that got Lauren down this path? Is there any yes, of that? Yes. Gentle teasing? Yes. Aw. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. My dad, my dad, especially my, my dad loves to, you know, to, you know, tease me about that. And it's, and it's funny. So my dad's a character. So, um, <laughs> you know, it, cause you, you think, you know, of, you know, wildlife biology, it's already this field that, you know, some people who don't really understand it question because you sort of tell people, oh, well, I'm a wildlife major. I study wildlife. I work with, you know, birds or, you know, whatever species of animal you work with. And it, it's not that normal job that you hear. You know, no. it's not me saying, you know, oh, yeah, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a medical doctor or, you know, I'm a nurse or, you know, I'm a lawyer. It's not that common job. It's that not a show on uh, TV and Netflix that people can Right. Watch. It's not... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It is not is not a show like on TV. It's like you know, it's not Grey's Anatomy for sure. Like you know, it's should nothing, be Lauren. You know? There should be like some sitcom about wildlife biologists. I think that yes. would be amazing. Yes, wouldn't it? Oh, that would be so amazing. <laughs> that would be so amazing. But yeah, but you know, I joke with people, and I'm like, no, you know, I'm 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 not Dr. Gray. You know, in Grey's Anatomy, like you know, I'm sorry, but. I, it's it's so it's it's just it's one of those again it's one of those jobs where you sort of have to take the time to explain to people you know why I do you know what I do and why this is important so I will admit that my dad you know was one of those people at first he was sort of like you know you're going for wildlife biology like okay like what are you gonna do with that you know because I mean parents they want what's you know they they want the best for you of mm -hmm. course and my and my parents have been supportive and they will always be supportive of me and whatever i decide to do you know in my life but it 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 came a time you know really and it was a really hard time in my life to where i was sort of questioning you know if this was the right path for me because i was just getting so much you know questionable responses from people like you know well Oh. Like, what are you going to do with this? How are you going to make money? Like, <laughs> you know, like how are you really going to support yourself? Like you need to get established, you know, even me being in school, because I'm, 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 I'm a young professional, so I'm only 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it, it, you know, I still get, you know, sometimes, sometimes my parents every now and then, you know, especially with me going for my master's and wanting to go for a PhD, they're like, Oh, you're going to still be in school. Like, all right, well, like, when are you going to be done with school? <laughs> you know, like, so there's always that. 
it you know, takes a long time. People yes. don't understand that. It yes, does. it takes a very long time. So, so my master's was for two years, and then my PhD is going to be for at least four. So yeah. I'm now entering my second year. So my first year just flew by, um, and now I'm entering my second year. And I mean, but yeah, it's I've been having you know an absolute blast with the work oh, that that's you know good. I do, and I I absolutely love it. So I, <laughs> I have such respect for the people we interview, like yourself, on the podcast. Um, I, the, I don't have anything above a bachelor's degree. I have two, yeah. two bachelors to be a high school, um, science teacher yeah. and the, that the research part just kills me. Um, I just have so much respect for the people, you know, you guys that write those papers and stuff like it hats is, it off is a, to you. It's a lot of hate relationship with There's a lot of work. There's a lot of work. Yeah. There's a lot of work. <laughs> my wife did her, my wife did her master's, uh, two or three years ago. And it was like while she was working full to full time. Right. So she did it over yes. the summer. Yes. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. And then you like, like you said, like and kudos, kudos to her because it's the same way with us grad students. You know, there's some grad students well, where, you know, I mean, your, your, your graduate studies are a full time job, but there's still, you know, students that have to go out, you know, and, and work and have, you know, another job in order to, you know, make ends meet. And I, I have full respect, you know, for those students that can <laughs> do that because it's, Gosh, because yeah, grad school can be grad school can be a challenge. Grad school can sometimes have like have you question your life at points. Like, all right, like why, like why am I, why am I doing this? Why am I still here? But then you have those moments throughout your career that that they remind you why you know why you're here and why you're doing what you're doing. And so that's that's sort of what keeps me you know pushing forward. I love that. And that ties into like the, the second, the second question, yes. which is your research that you're doing with birds. Um, yes. I'd love, I'd love for you to share with our audience what you're doing with that. Yes, of course. Of course. So um, I, so I'm an avian ecologist. So what I specifically focus on is really, I love to study how birds are interacting with their environment. And so my research specifically looks at climate change because climate change is, you know, this big, huge thing that, you know, we're all very concerned about. And so my work looks at climate change and its impacts on avian behavioral responses. So simply put, I am interested in looking at how climate change is impacting birds in their natural environments. So the species of bird that I currently work with for my PhD is the federally endangered red cockaded woodpecker. That's a, that's a big mouthful. So we call them the RCW for short. RCW. Um, I love it. Yes. Yes. The RCW. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and they're this species of bird. I, I would describe them. So, I mean, if you look them up, you would, you would see that they're, they're probably about the size of, you know, your Northern Cardinal. Um, mm -hmm. They get they get mistaken for downy and hairy woodpeckers a lot because they look very, very similar to, to downy and hairy woodpeckers. But this woodpecker is specifically found in the longleaf pine ecosystem because this is the ecosystem that they're endemic to. So anywhere that you will have a longleaf pine ecosystem is most likely where you would find, you know, a, a red, car, red, red cockaded woodpecker or RCW. Um, mm -hmm. So. Anyways, going back to my work, I'm actually doing two things. So one thing that I do is I help uh, agencies. So I work with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, as well as this nonprofit called the Sand Hills Ecological Institute, or SEI for short. And they're located in uh, Southern Pines, North Carolina. So that's where their office is. Um, so I work off of a property called the uh, Sand Hills Game Land. So it's a public property, public access where people can go and do all sorts of activities. They can, you know, hunt, they can, um, you know, fish, they could just, you know, go exploring, hike, horseback ride, you name it. Is but, it a huge area, Lauren? That sounds like that's a pretty big area. Yes, it is. It is acres and acres. It okay. is like like 60,000 plus acres. It's a, it's a huge, huge property. Yes, yes. It's a huge property. It covers about five different counties. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, but it's, it's a huge, but wonderful, wonderful property. It's, it's home to like this, again, the longleaf pine ecosystem. It's one of the most diverse ecosystems that, that you would ever, you know, see. It just has a lot of, you know, different, you know, rare and endangered plant species, animals, so, you know, et cetera. So the longleaf pine ecosystem is just a great place to be. And I absolutely love doing my work out there. Uh, but they also, so this, this ecosystem and this, this property, the, this on the Sand Hills game land, it, um, 
holds, you know, a, a small population of these red cockaded woodpeckers. So there are three populations of the RCW that I um, study that are, you know, within the data set that I work with. So there's a population in um, Eglin, so Eglin Air Force Base um, on the Western Panhandle of Florida. There's a population uh, on Camp Lejeune, uh, which is in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And there's also this population down here that I'm working with, which is in South Central North Carolina here on the Sandhills game land. So um, I help these agencies not only uh, monitor this, you know, this, this, this woodpecker on this property that I'm on. Um, so I have these, these different, um, so I can go, <laughs> there's, I can go into a whole bunch with this bird because they're, they're what we call a, a cooperative breeder. So they will live in these family groups. Um, made up of about, you know, anywhere from two to, to eight uh, members. Uh, members are usually related. They're usually males from previous um, broods that will stick around and they will help what we call the breeder male and the breeder female raise, you know, the next set of chicks. Um, and so this bird has a very interesting social Ooh. system that's, you know, it gets complicated, but it's very interesting to, you it's know, like a team of learn. uncles helping raise yeah, the babies. Yeah, exactly, 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 exactly. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I mean, it's just these these birds are absolutely amazing. But so, so cool. Exactly. So not not only do I help these agencies, you know, monitor the species, because again, they are federally endangered. There have been, you know, some talks uh, every now and then about, you know, or, or decisions on whether to delist them from endangered to threatened. Um, so that's still, you know, sort of a going back and forth thing, trying to decide on that. But until then, we want to keep, you know, up with the monitoring and the management that we're doing because we don't want to see this species and their populations, you know, decline again because their populations are doing fairly, fairly well. So that's one side of my research that I work with. The other side is, um, you know, doing my own research looking at the climate change aspects. So um, the specifically the population in Eglin. So that was the one on the Western Panhandle of Florida. Uh, scientists have been sort of, and researchers have been sort of seeing this, uh, what we call this brood, this brood reduction phenomenon. So basically um, what they're seeing is that we're seeing that, that not a lot of our nestlings are, are fledging. So for example, here we would have maybe, so let's say, for example, we had about four nestlings that successfully, you know, hatched from their eggs. Mm -hmm. And when it's time for them to fledge, only, you know, two fledge or only one fledge. And so this sort of has become a pattern over the last, you know, two years. And so with that, you know, concern, they're, they're thinking, the researchers down there in Florida, they're thinking that this may have something to do with climate change. Because you think about oh. Florida, you think, you know, they get all kinds of extreme weather events and hurricanes, et cetera. Um, you know, everything. all the time in Canada. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There and, you go. And North there you go. like the Carolinas, to be honest with you, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, you know, this and with climate change, we're getting, you know, again, extreme weather. We're getting these rising temperatures. Mm. That's another thing. Gosh, rising temperatures. I'm ready for summer to be over at this point. <laughs> I am ready. <laughs> I am ready for it to be fall. Hey, we only get is... we only get two months of summer up here, so yeah, we need that's it. Summer that's, we it. Get. that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. I am just like so. Like today, you know, the, this on this day that we're speaking, it's it's very cool outside. We're like in like the sixties right now. You know, it's it's supposed to get you know up to about you know, around the eighties, but right now we're in the sixties, and it was so nice and cool when I stepped outside, and I was like, oh, I am ready for fall. <laughs> like I am ready for fall. Um, but yes. Yeah, Yes, bring, on anyways, the, bring on so, the pumpkin spice lattes. Yes, bring on the pumpkin spice latte. Yes, for sure. I'm sorry, yes, I'm sorry Lauren, I'm der derailing your, your talk. You were <laughs> fine. No, you were fine. You were fine. Um, but yes, and so and so with this pattern that these researchers are seeing in Florida, we sort of want to, we sort of have this concern back here in North Carolina, you know, whether or not what they're seeing in that population in Florida is what's to come for these populations down here, you know, in North Carolina. So that's sort of where my work comes in is to, you know, I, I, as, as much as I would love to, you know, answer the question fully, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, that won't happen, but I will be able to sort of add on to this data set and add on, you know, you know, add on to the knowledge that we already know, you know, about this hmm. bird, you know, so that's, that's sort of where, you know, my work comes in looking at climate change again and it's and it's you know you know relationship and its effects that it's having on on this species of woodpecker 
So I, just a follow-up question because I'm not a bird person. Um, yes. To be able to fledge, they don't fly away. They they die in right. the nest. Right. Is that what right. happens? Right. Right. So they, so they do not leave. Yeah. So they do not um, leave their cavity. So yeah, when they, they fledge, I'm talking about them like leaving, leaving their, their cavity um, in, in the tree. So, um, and usually this, this happens. So again, I, I would love, so I, I, I keep joking with people because, but, but I'm kind of serious at the same time, but I would love to find a way to find a way to put like some sort of like cameras in these cavities because we would know so much about these birds, you know, in, you know, and what they do in their cavities. Because again, you, you go to a tree one day and you see that there may be, you know, three, three nestlings. And then you go another day and there's only two. And it's sort of like, you know, what happened in between that time to that nestling? Mm, that's sort of, yeah. that's sort of where this question is coming up with birds failing to fledge. So, you know, mm. we only have two that, you know, have, you know, made it out the nest successfully. So what happened to those other, you know, those other ones that, you know, somehow something happened to them and they, you know, they either, you know, disappeared or, you know, what, what have you, we yeah. don't know. It's yeah. a mystery. Yeah. It's a mystery. It is a, it is a mystery for sure. Yes. Yes. And then, <laughs> I mean, and going back to, you know, so fun facts again about the red cockaded woodpecker, I, I would, I would, you know, urge anyone to just look up the history of this bird because it's, it's absolutely amazing. So they're the only um, species in North, North, uh, North American woodpecker who will excavate their cavities in living pine trees. So you think of a woodpecker and you think of, you know, woodpeckers usually, you know, excavate, make their cavities in, you know, dead, decaying trees. Yes. You know, and but these woodpeckers, the RCW, they make their they make their cavities in living pine trees. And they're the only species. Holy, in North America they must be tough to as them. hell. Yeah. To, to make yeah. It, it, takes, <laughs> it takes them years. It, it takes really what? it takes them years. It can take them anywhere from about, you know, 10 to 13 years to excavate a full cavity because, and you have to think because this is a living, you know, a living pine tree. So they're, yeah. they have to excavate through multiple, multiple layers of that yeah. tree to, you know, get them a good sturdy cavity. Yes. 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 That's unbelievable. So, it's like, and, and, <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm just then, trying to see, think of an like, analogy. It's like chipping away, chipping away at a live pine tree yes. with like, I don't know, a fork. Yes. Right? Because yes. their beaks are made exactly, of metal. Exactly. Exactly it. Kind of exactly, fork it or something. exactly it. Exactly it. And I mean, and there's there's so much, you know, why this species is endemic to the longleaf pine ecosystem, because this the, this ecosystem, it gives this species what it needs. And so that's sort of why it's important to sort of understand and study what is happening with this species because this species needs this longleaf pine ecosystem so it can't leave you know so that's why mm. we have to not only conserve the species but conserve the ecosystem as well because it's not like these birds can you know if things get bad they can you know hop from one place to another they have to stay within this ecosystem it's all, so, they, all they know yes. all and they so do. you know right 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 and so and conserving this ecosystem that involves anything from using you know prescribed fire um, to, you know, you know, to, then that creates that open, you know, understory that the birds absolutely love, um, mm -hmm. prescribed fire not only helps, you know, the RCW, but it helps other species that live in the longleaf pine ecosystem as well. Um, taking care, you know, of the longleaf pine trees. So not only do these birds need living trees, but they need older trees. They need trees that are about a hundred years old. Uh, so, you know, making sure, you know, that these trees are, you know, good and they stick around for a while. That's, that's another priority that we have to consider. So, I mean, going back to, for example, I keep using the population down in Florida as my example, because they get a lot of, you know, hurricanes and stuff. The hurricanes are knocking down these, these trees that, you know, the birds need. And so that's, you know, so that's a concern right there in itself. So, I mean, climate change is creating this concern with, you know, RCW biologists, you know, and, and just wanting to continue to make sure that this, that the species and their populations are, are good for years to come. So that's, that's where my work comes in. And I just, I only hope that, you know, it can continue uh, because, you know, we, we want to know as much about this bird um, and its populations as, as possible and especially how climate change is impacting them. I love it. What I'm, I'm so fascinated by this bird. Um, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a birder, uh, but yeah. like, I, I love them. We have, um, we live on a farm, right? In the, yes. in the kind of in the middle of nowhere, Alberta, Canada. So there's tons of cool birds that fly by, and I'm like, "Hey, yeah. those are birds," and that's about all I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but well, hey, well, you have to start here. somewhere. You have yeah. to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we, we have woodpeckers. I'm not sure what type of they are, but we see, like, I see them on the walks with the dogs through the forest and they're just yes. interesting little creatures. So yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I don't know what woodpecker they are. I don't think they're the one you're talking about. On the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. Do you, do you remember what they look like? Can you, this, this is, this is my favorite because Man, especially, and, like, especially some, people, like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I call them. <laughs> Because I love, I love asking people that question because, you know, because you're always going to get something that's like, oh, well, I think it was this color or you know, it looked like this and it was this big. And then so, you know, us birders, we start putting that together and we're like, hmm. <laughs> don't, don't know what kind of bird that was, but OK, <laughs> we're glad you saw it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I have a, I have a really tough question for you, Lauren. Um yeah. What's your favorite bird? Is it the one that you've been studying or do you have a secret, <laughs> secret, yes, secret bird yes, that yes. Uh, will make your RCWs jealous? <laughs> yes. So by default, the, the RCW is, is one of my favorite birds, but up until I started working with the RCW, I mean, and, and it's, and it's still my, it's still one of my favorites. Don't get me wrong. But up until I started working with the RCW, I always told people that my favorite bird was the Eastern Phoebe. So the Eastern Phoebe is a species of flycatcher. Um, and so people always ask me, you know, well, why is it your favorite bird? And my, and my answer is very lame, but it's, but this is why I love them. Um, so flycatchers will do this thing, you know, where they, when they're perched, they're, they sort of do this little tail bob, you know, so their tail is like bobbing up and down, back and yeah. forth, up and down. And this bird, so it's like a little, you know, it's like a little gray, it's a little gray bird. It's, its chest is, you know, usually white. And um, it, it, I, I just find, I just think it is the most adorable thing when they're just perched and, you know, especially when they're preening and they're all fluffed out, they're all, you know, puffed <laughs> out and yeah. their little tail is just bobbing up and down. I, I absolutely love it. So the Eastern Phoebe is, is one of my all time favorite birds and the, and the RCW is as well. So, I mean, they're sort of, they're sort of competing for one another because right now they're sort of equal, uh, but <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. I just but Google yeah, I, image search the Phoebe as you were talking. Yeah, they're pretty adorable little yes, things. They're super cute. They're super cute. And <laughs> and usually, and like I said, people usually ask me too because they're like, if you if you ever hear a Phoebe's call, they're like an alarm clock. So if you're ever sleeping and one's next to your window, it's <laughs> it's it's gonna wake you up. Like it's they are they are your personal alarm clock because they're because their call can be quite can be quite loud, but but it's it's really it's they are super adorable. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of I do know the name of some birds. Um, probably one of my favorite birds are the chickadees because they're yes. winter birds. They stick around in our winters for a long time. Yes. I don't yes. think they actually a lot. I think some of them winter up here. Um, and they when they fluff themselves out, they look like little miniature penguins, and they're yes, so adorable. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Yes, and I'm and I'm sure with those chickadees, you see a lot of uh, what we call uh, tufted uh, tit tit mouses. So they're those there's those like they're like a gray bird, um, mm -hmm. and they, they so they're they're actually close cousins with the Carolina with the with the chickadees. So um, usually when you see a chickadee, you'll usually most likely see a tufted tit mouse with them. Um, you know, oh, they're buds. They travel together. together. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> so uh, uh, birds are cool. <laughs> <laughs> are cool. Yep. Well, there you go. Now we know Lauren's secret, secret favorite bird, uh, aside yes. from the RCW. Aside from the RCW, yes. <laughs> okay, so Lauren, we have a couple standard questions that we ask our guests on the, the podcast. Um, yes. And the first one is for our guest to share a pet story, some story from their life with an, a pet um, that's memorable. Um, do you have one for us? Yes. Well, so it's actually a pretty recent story. So I, so I, if, if, if you end up following me on social media, so I, I have a hamster, I have a pet hamster. His name Aww. is Munch. What's yes. His name? His name sorry, is Munch. I said awe over your, what is his name? Sorry. <laughs> Munch. M-U-N-C-H. M -M oh yes. <laughs> yes. Munch. Um, and he is a long haired Syrian hamster. I, I got him about a year ago because me being in grad school, you know, I was sort mm -hmm. of like, well, I, I, I want a companion, but then at the same time, I'm all over the place. I can't sit still, you know, with my research and stuff. It takes me here and here and here. So I was sort of like, what's a great pet for me to have that would be, you know, manageable, you know, for my time, but also, you know, just a great companion to have. So 
I um, went with a long haired Syrian hamster. So I've had him for about a year now and he is just an absolute joy. Uh, if you, every now and then I will dress him up in cute little outfits and I'll share them on my <laughs> social media and people probably think I'm crazy, but some people, most people absolutely love it <laughs> because they have probably never seen a more spoiled hamster in their life. I mean, I spoil, I spoil this guy with everything that I have. Um, but he is, he's just, he's my, he's my baby and he's my absolute joy. So um, so yeah, if you, if you end up following me on Instagram and Twitter, get ready for some cute, uh, hamster photos <laughs> in costumes. I'm actually, I'm actually planning out his little, um, Halloween costume, um, as we speak. So <laughs> where do you find clothes small enough to fit a hamster? Because yes. we so struggle because I- we, we do dress up Bunsen and Beaker. Um, yes. if you follow us yes. and I'm yes. working on dressing up ginger and it's going pretty good. That's the new good. cat and son rescued. But yes. finding cat size clothing, that is finding, a challenge. Yes. So Amazon. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Amazon is my savior. So if you look up like little hamster clothes, you know, little they hamster have it. clothes. Oh, okay. Bingo. Bingo. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. It may it may not be that much, but I but I get it to work. I get it to work. So <laughs> <laughs> I need to I need to advocate for more little hamster clothes on Amazon. So I need to I need to write them a letter. <laughs> That's where we got all Ginger's hats from. We got like yes. a, I searched cat hats and there are thousands of cat hats. Uh, and I got like a variety pack and we've been slowly yes. training her to wear yes. them with, you know, treats because cats don't like to wear hats. And <laughs> yeah, I love cute. it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, right. but that is my that is my pet story there. <laughs> Adorable. Thanks, Lauren. Yes. Thanks of for course. sharing that. Of the The other question that we ask our guests that's kind of standard is for the super fact. And the super yes. fact is something that you know yes. that when you tell people, it kind of like blows their mind a bit. Uh, do you have yes. a super fact for us? I do have a super fact. So since our conversation has been about, you know, mostly woodpeckers and my work with woodpeckers, I have a super fact about woodpeckers. So, um, as most people probably know, in order for woodpeckers to make their homes, so they excavate cavities, you know, in trees, they have to continuously, you know, bang on the trees <laughs> continuously in order to make, you know, that that entrance to their cavity. So people go, you know, people who don't know, they they sort of question it and be like, well, doesn't that hurt? Like, isn't like, does wouldn't that give you a headache to keep yeah, banging exactly. on a tree? <laughs> You I know, think like if, I did, forth, yeah, if a human like, did it once, you'd go to the hospital. Yes, yes, yes. And I mean, and I, I was, I was in that boat too at first. I was like, well, how in the world are they able to do that without getting a major headache? <laughs> what in the world? So there's this really cool thing that woodpeckers have. So woodpeckers actually have a very, very long tongue. So they have this long tongue that actually wraps around their brain all the way to the back. So literally wraps around their brain and this acts as a cushion. So when they're there excavating and beating on these trees, Ooh. their, their tongue, their very, very long tongue is acting as a cushion what? in order to, yes. What? Yes. No. <laughs> yes. It's like, it's like some kind of like, sl- like rubbery, yes. slimy shock yes. absorber. Yes. Yes. And it is, it's literally, you, you hit it on the money. It acts as a shock absorber. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. So what? that's how woodpeckers can do it, folks. <laughs> how, how long is their tongue again? Like it's long, right? Because they it's can. It's long. It's very, yeah. it's very long. Yes. It is very so, long. Yes. And, or yes. Yes. So if yes. some UFC fighter had like a ridiculously oversized, disgusting tongue <laughs> and rolled it up in their face, they yes. wouldn't be able to get knocked out probably. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And so yes, their their tongue is so long that it's able to wrap around their brain and act like a cushion. What? Yep. Okay, yep. that is I don't know if I can recover from this super fact. <laughs> I did. I had no idea. I just thought I didn't know what I thought. I just like, oh, that's what they do. They can do that. But there's yes. got to be a reason. And that's the reason. Yes, yes, yes. That is the oh, reason. Holy moly. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. That is a super, that, that is a super fact. Because um, my mind is blown. Um, Mission okay, accomplished. Just, I'm, I'm, re- I'm composing myself to continue this interview. Here. Uh, wow. 
Okay, well, that thanks for sharing that super fact. I think people yes. might have to, if they're driving, they've pulled over on the side of the road. and Like, what you know. did she just say? Yeah, this exactly. <laughs> I apologize for the traffic snafu whenever you're listening to this. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, the, <clears throat> the last question is, uh, it's a fun one. We get to ask our guests uh, to, to talk about something that they're passionate about in the important to you section, this could be a hobby or a cause. Um, and our guests can take it anywhere they want. Lauren, you want to talk about two things, um, science communication and um, promoting uh, like underrepresented people in, in your, in your field. Yes, for sure. For sure. For sure. So yeah, I'll, I'll start off with my science communication. Cause that can sort of lead into my, my second cause there with, mm -hmm. with diversity in the field. So aside from my research, I am heavily involved in science communication. So I'm a part of the uh, public science cluster here at NC State. It's a group of us who basically communicate science to the public. And we do this in ways that the general public can understand. Because as mm -hmm. you could probably imagine with us scientists, with all the papers that we write and all of our you know academic jargon, when people sort of sit down and maybe try to read our research or even try to understand what we're doing, they may get sort of confused. And with that, they'll get disconnected, you know, instantly from it and just not get anything out of it. So my <laughs> job, it, like, literally, so, so they're just like, yeah, okay, well, I, I thought I understood it, but mm, I give up. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> So my job and my other colleagues as well, um, we sort of want to, our job is to sort of break that barrier and make science, you know, you know, accessible to all, so to speak. So um, there, there is an art that, you know, you have to learn in order to, you know, make your, make science, you know, relate, you know, with other audiences so that they can, you know, relate to the science that you're talking about. So with my science communication, I do, you know, a ton of things. So I'm very active on social media with, you know, any science communication that I do with explaining, you know, facts about these RCWs to doing little short, you know, funny reels about grad school, you know, and giving grad school <laughs> advice. I'll have um, to check this out. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I... I write a lot. So I, I have written pieces for, you know, BBC Wildlife. Um, I'm a freelance writer for the Nature Conservancy. I've been featured in features from, you know, National Geographic to eBird um, to the Cincinnati Zoo. So I, I absolutely, you know, love, love to, you know, write and contribute to, you know, writing pieces, uh, you know, about science, about birds, about wildlife that other audiences, you know, can read and they can relate to. Um, I do, I do things such as this podcast. So this podcast that I'm doing with you, I will go on podcasts and I will talk about my work. Um, I will do, uh, you know, public speaking events. So I'll go to organizations and do all sorts of public speaking. So that's sort of, you know, I, I have found the importance of science communication and, you know, why it's important to do that sort of stuff in order for other people who aren't heavily involved in science to understand what we're doing and why our science is important. Um, the other thing, and that sort of leads me into my other cause, is my cause for, you know, I'm very passionate about, um, you know, getting more diversity in this field of wildlife biology. So plain and simple, wildlife biology is, you know, a plain and simple, a white man field. It's, it's all that you sort of see, you know, in wildlife biology, you know, we're starting to see a few women, but, you know, it's mostly all, you know, your, your average white man. And of I'm course, picturing like a 45 year old white dude yes. in a hat with a beard. Yes, yes. yes. exactly, exactly, hats. exactly. And of course, we're not seeing, you know, so the first thing, you know, if you look up wildlife biology, the first thing that you probably, you know, would not see is a person of color or a minority. So when you look at that, especially for people who maybe want to go into the field of wildlife biology, who are, you know, minorities, they look at that and they don't see themselves in this environment. They don't see themselves in wildlife biology. So they sort of stray away from it. And they're like, OK, well, it looks like this isn't for me. So maybe let me find something different. And I want to be an advocate for that. And I want to change that. So continuously through my work. I want to, you know, I advocate for, you know, diversity and any, any way that I can have, you know, like be, you know, any way that I can be exposed to the public, whether it be on a podcast, whether it be through my writing, whether it be through, you know, a public, you know, speaking event, I want other minorities to see me and to see what I've accomplished and what I'm doing. And with that, I'm hoping, you know, that they see that and they're like, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. 
So I am, I'm very much all for this cause of increasing, you know, diversity and, you know, not only wildlife biology, but in the STEM field, you know, in general. So not only myself, but there's amazing, there's other amazing, you know, scientists here on Twitter, black scientists, minorities, you know, indigenous that are doing wonderful work in the science field that, you know, and this is why we're doing it because we want people to see that, hey, this field is for us too. You know, we, we exist, we matter, and we love doing what what we do so that's that (laughs) there's my soundboard i love it i love it i love it (laughs) that's important work lauren um does the science communication obviously super important work not all scientists have the the, i think because our account is a science communication account right it's it's definitely a different one but Right. Not all scientists, I think, have the right skill set. And I'm so glad that you do because it, it's a skill to break down the important parts of science yes. into something that the public who has no training in science yes. can not only understand, but also be excited to learn. Yes. That's the missing thing. Like you could break down physics into something somebody could understand, but it may not right. be interesting. Right? right. And that's the big thing about science communication. It has to be right. understandable. Yes. And the the yes. person has to connect with it and find yes. it interesting. Yes. There yeah. And you your, tic- your TikTok stuff is great. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I started doing this new thing. Um, or maybe I it's Instagram it- Reels. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. 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 Instagram Reels. Yeah. You're fine. Um, I, I've started doing this new thing. Um, I, I call it RCW Wednesday. So I, I use the hashtag RC Woodpecker um, because I, unfortunately, RCW, RC Wednesdays, that's what I was going to hashtag it. But unfortunately, that was sort of taken on Twitter. And I was like, eh, I kind of want my own thing. So I, I still call it RCW Wednesday, but I use a different hashtag. So hashtag RC uh, woodpecker is what I use, but every Wednesday I bring my audience, you know, one cool and interesting fact about red cockaded woodpeckers. So I thought that was something very new and interesting that I wanted to try out. So I just started that last week. So we'll see how it goes. But so far I've gotten great, you know, great reception from it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, again, you know, introducing people to this wonderful species of woodpecker, you know, that I work with. So <laughs> yay. And then like the second part is, <clears throat> Um, I, I so applaud you putting yourself out there to promote the idea that anybody can do wildlife biology and that you are the person that other kids can see themselves in. Right. Um, that's a big, big deal. And as an educator, just thank you for being that role model for the kids that I teach, because that's what I do in, in high school. Uh, if we're talking, about birds, I'll pull up pictures of the people like you. I'm like, this is Lauren. She's a wildlife biologist. And then the kids in my class will see themselves in you. And that's yes. super important. So thank you yes. for that. Yes. Well, I, I, I appreciate the work that you do as an educator because it all starts in the classroom. So the work that you're doing is is absolutely phenomenal. So I applaud you for that. So thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't send this question ahead of time, Lauren, but is there, is there any organizations that we could direct people to around, um, diversity in wildlife biology? I don't know if there's anything, if not, I can cut this. You know what? Hmm. I know I've talked to Karina Newsom a couple times, like there's Black Birders Week. Like the, the right, trend. so the, right, so there's Black Birders Week. So all of those, um, so so uh, Black AF and STEM. So if you follow okay. that account, you know, they have different weeks. So like, you know, Black and Black and Kim. Yeah, you know, Black, Black and Birders Kim just Week. happened. That was so cool. Oh my yes. goodness. Yes, yes. It was super, super cool. Super, super cool. Um, and actually a, a colleague of mine um, and I are actually working on um, a new organization uh, that we're trying to put together. So I won't talk too much about it, but, um, that that's in, that's in the works. So we're super excited Mm. um, for that as well, but it's also catering towards, you know, more diversity in the wildlife field. Um, and especially in field work. So that's a whole other topic that we can go off on a tangent about, but, you know, minorities, you know, doing field work in these, in these areas where you may not feel, you know, safe or welcome, et cetera. Mm. That's sort of what our organization is gonna, you know, cater to. So that's something that we're working on currently right now. Yes. Yes. But yeah, I would, I would, I honestly, I would say, yeah, I would say black AF and STEM is 
probably a great bet. Like you said, Karina's a great, a great resource for that as well, because she deals with a lot of, you know, diversity stuff, you know, with her position that she has right now also. Um, I'm trying to think specifics. Hmm. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think we yeah. just directing people to that hashtag or that account. Um, people that would be great. Use, yes. There's yes. thousands and thousands of yes. scientists that interact with that. So. Yes. There you Perfect. go. Well, Lauren, we're, we're coming to the end of this amazing interview. Uh, just first off, thank you for taking the time on a Saturday to chat what you do. You're so passionate and so funny. Thank you so much for being a guest of today. Of course. I, again, I appreciate you reaching out and for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And the other <laughs> thing is, um, I know you have social media accounts. Can you plug them? Like where can yes, people find you? I can, I can definitely plug them. Yes. So you can follow me um, at L-D-P-H-A-R-R. So my last name, L-D-F-A-R. Um, and I am on Instagram and Twitter. So that's the Perfect. same, the same, uh, Username on his, on Instagram and Twitter. Yes. LD Far. Got it. Far. Yes. Okay. And, and we'll hyperlink. For those of you who uh, check the show notes, um, there'll be a hyperlink to um, Lauren's Twitter account and Instagram yes. account. On, yes. Twitter, on the- Instagram. And then I also have a website also if you want to check it out. Um, that would be www.lfar.com. Oh, nice. My- Keeping it consistent. Yes. Good job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody took points in burner. Somebody took Bunsen burner on Instagram um, yeah. and we had to underscore it or something's weird. There's a dot gap. Oh. Anyways. Yeah. Oh, oh gosh. Oh, I know. God, <laughs> well, Lauren, thank you again for being a guest today and uh, best Lauren. wishes in the future. Uh, as we always say to any guest, <clears throat> if there's any science that you'd like us to augment, just tag us, just tag us or send us a DM and we'll get it out there. We have quite a few followers. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, again, I thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Okay, it is time for story time with me, Adam. And ooh, you might not, you might not. Or you, whoa, we have a special guest. Um, on this, on this part of story time, we have a special guest. No, we don't have a special guest. You don't want to be a special guest, or you do want to be a special guest? You want to be a special guest? Okay, so we do have a special guest. Annalise is back. Um, yeah. Annalise, do you have any stories about our pets or the pets at the farm? Uh, you got to oh. come over here. Go right. In. Well, I have a very short story, but it's been very recently where when I come to the house, Bunsen and Beaker jump so much now. Like it's insane, and it's it's for ten minutes. Like they won't stop, and they're so happy yeah. to see you. Well, I hope that's it. They go kind of crazy, but <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what's been happening. Okay, that's Annalisa's story, I guess. Dishing about um, poorly behaved dogs that are very happy to see her. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, I have a story. I have an update on the chicken situation. We saw oh. the baby chick again today. Papa took them out and let them out. And the baby chick is so cute. It's still super tiny and slightly fuzzy. And we saw the cutest thing ever. It rode the back of the mama chicken. And what? the mom, the mother chicken is a different color than all of the other chickens. It's like a little bit more orange. And the little baby was on its back. And it was just, it was so cute. It was so cute to see it just riding around on the back. It's like, uh, ginger with Bunsen. We could probably do that. Um, <laughs> some scratching. But yeah, the ch- the little chicken is out now, so you you might see it around. Um, yeah, that's my story. Um, we might we might have a name for the chicken. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a funny name. We named it Fart. Okay. Yeah, it's its name is Fart. Um, yeah, that's my story. Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. I don't know if you can hear the dogs chomping, 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 chomping on the treats I gave them, uh, the chews that I gave them, because that's the only thing that keeps them quiet during story time and or (laughs) spaces and or any time I'm at the computer trying to do some work. 
Bunsen is Bark City. <laughs> anyway, that's not my story. My story is that I did not listen to Jason today. And you might think, what? That's strange. Well, he was on the phone with me and we were having a conversation. It was after school and it was after his workout. And he's like, how was your day? And I'm like, oh, it was great. How was your day? Oh, it was great. And we were talking, talking, talking about just incidentals that happen in our day or in our life. And at that time, I took the dogs out and I had Beaker and Bunsen. And Beaker was having a heyday digging a hole in the dirt. Now, the dirt would be very soft because like a mole has been by. And so she can smell the mole. And she was digging and she was getting the weeds out. And I'm like, mm, win, win. And Jason said, don't let her dig on the phone. And I said, too late. And I let her dig. And she's digging around. Uh, she's just digging <laughs> around. And she was so happy. And her little face and her teeth and everything was covered in dirt. And she was so cute and so happy. So I let her dig. I didn't listen to Jason. And that's my story. Oh, my goodness. I haven't yet to see how big the hole is because she can dig giant holes so quickly. Uh, Dad, do you have a story? Sure. So, um, yeah. So what I've been doing with the dogs and the cat is random challenges. So we're doing this um, catnip six where Ginger is um, doing this double blind st study. A uh, scientist sent us socks full of catnip and catnip attracting plants. And um, we're doing some kind of tournament with them. It's a lot of fun. I've been showing it to my classes at school and they are so invested um, when they found out today, I didn't shoot a new catnip six, six last night to show them today. Um, they were upset. They couldn't believe there wasn't a new catnip six. So they're super invested in that. And the other thing that I've been doing is making them jump like barricades. And I did this cup one this week, this cup one this week, which was a lot of fun. Um, and it's fun having all of them because they all like to do stuff. Ginger will do stuff for her little salmon treats and the dogs are love to do salmon, anything for salmon. And I just find it hilarious that they know when I'm starting to set up an obstacle course, they get all excited. Ginger like comes real close and she's meowing and the dogs are like on me like a dirty shirt because they know they get to do their little game and they get treats at the end of it. So that's, it's been really wholesome and fun to do that. And I think I'm going to continue it as long as I can think of new mazes or random obstacles for them to jump yeah i help you uh with those as well like it's a team effort it's not team jason well no the last one i did all by myself that was like a lot of work in the basement yeah the one you did downstairs <laughs> you did all by yourself all <laughs> yeah. by myself don't want to be all by myself is that a song yes it is i've never heard about that song before i think that's not true is it from Saturday Night Live? <laughs> no. Okay, so that's story time. And I hope you guys enjoyed the special guest. We sure do. Um, but yeah, I hope to see you guys on the next episode um, during my family, during the family section. During my section. Um, but yeah, bye-bye. Well, that's it for this week's show. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to us. And special thanks to our expert guest, Lauren Farr, who talked to us about the woodpecker that she adores and studies. It was such a great chat. We'd also like to give a shout out to the Paw Pack. These are our patrons that support us and the top tiers get their names called at the end of the podcast. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Take it away, Chris. GB Elby, Tracy Domingue, Anne, Julie Smith, Sharon Dotson, Andrew Lynn, Elizabeth Parmente, Peggy McKeel, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Jaguer, Chris Kelly, Leela Periello, Sam, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Jody Ogren, Mary Ryder, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Marianne McNally, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, Ben Rathert, and Bianca Hyde. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh -huh.